decided we're in the general category, and you can vote once a day until the 15th. If you're hearing this after the 15th, well, I'll just go fuck myself. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Fireside Chats. Hello, higher side chatters, drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and I hope you have a campfire handy, because today, kids, we're going to hear some stories. Back in black for the second time on THC, one of my favorite fringe topic journalists tackling everything under the paranormal sun. He's been on UFO Hunters, Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, and one credit I'm a bit curious about, actually, Countdown with Keith Oberman. Nick Redfern, my man, welcome back. How's life? Hi, Greg. Doing good, thanks. How's things with you? Things are excellent. Um, good. So let me ask you real quick, what, what did land you on Countdown with Keith Oberman? <laughs> well, it was actually about um, probably seven or eight years ago now. And what happened was that the, the U.S. Air Force released a document through the terms of the Freedom of Information Act, which um, addressed a project that they'd actually kick-started to try and determine if... Um, the, the, the sort of technology that we see on um, on Star Trek, you know, sort of beam me up Scotty type uh, mm-hmm. technology could actually be considered feasible. You know, if you could really teleport people from one place to another. And the Air Force kind of gave it up as a bit of a bad job in the end. But it was interesting that, you know, the whole issue of teleportation was something that sort of occupied their minds for a long time. And um, so they had me on the show talking about, you know, this sort of stranger than fiction project that the air force was involved in <laughs> that's kind of cool um <laughs> well you know your new book the world's weirdest place is pretty much the book i've been wanting my whole life because you write about places your top 25 hotspots for strangeness and because it's about places you can include ufos the loch ness monster demons ghosts and everything else but how did you pick your top 25 well i guess it was just one of the situations where there were certain criteria I was looking for you know it what you know say for example somebody sees a Bigfoot in one particular town and then somebody else knows the haunted house in another town well it doesn't necessarily make the place strange you know it just means there's one weird thing took place or happened there right so what I did was to look at various places around the world that seem to be saturated literally in like a, a very very broad range of weird stuff so in other words if you had like an old village or isolated town where there have been sightings of ufos of bigfoot of werewolves that there was a cult activity going on paranormal phenomena um, portals and window areas and you know, interdimensional stories and things like that but they're all situated and focused on one area then that, to me, suggested it was the place that was weird rather than just the things that were appearing there. So that's what I did, was to sort of pick out 25 places that fell into that particular category and um, and then sort of focused on the best ones I could find. Nice. Um, one of my favorite parts, which I had never heard about, and the location's only 350 miles from where I live, is the <laughs> stories of the crazy caverns in Death Valley. How did those come about? Well, yeah, I mean, Death Valley is an interesting place. There's a, a lot of weirdness attached to it. And certainly um, one, of, one of the strangest stories coming out of Death Valley are the, the tales of what are called the Sailing Stones. Now, you can go to certain parts of Death Valley pretty much any time of year, and you'll see these massive stones anywhere from sort of 30 pounds to literally like about 170, 180 pounds in weight. But are sitting still, like seemingly frozen on the desert floor, but they've got this long track behind them, as if they've literally moved across the desert surface. So in some cases, like up to a couple of miles, and they even appear on occasion to have actually done like a 180 degree turn and gone back the way they've came. That is so um, weird. Yeah, it is. It's very weird. Now, a number of sort of very down-to-earth scenarios have been put forward that initially, at least, do seem to make sense. The idea is that you know, Death Valley 
is a very dry and hot location. So the desert floor is like solid. But sometimes they have these very out of the blue sudden floods and downpours of very heavy rain. So in other words, the desert floor goes from being very hard to very muddy. And because it has this hard surface, the water settles on top of the, of the hard sand. And so the theory is that when like a very large wind blows through the valley, is it possible that that tremendous wind and that thin veneer of water actually is enough of a stimulus to sort of get the stones moving, kind of like a, you know, a little boat on a body of water, so to mm-hmm. speak, and that when the sand dries up, you know, the, the stone comes to a grinding halt. Now, the only problems with those theories, uh, number one is the fact that numerous scientists and university teams and all sorts of people have been out there. Nobody's ever actually caught um, the, the stones in movement. And that even involves, you know, sort of late night stop motion cameras that are put out, you know, to to film anything that suddenly moves. Even those haven't picked it up. And, of course, the other big problem is that because some of these stones literally weigh in the order of sort of 170, 180 pounds, a number of scientists have suggested it's a very dubious scenario to suggest that wind, even if there was a thin veneer of water, could actually kickstart stones weighing close on 200 pounds. Right. You know, it's one thing to suggest they could keep them moving when the momentum's going, but could they actually start them moving? I mean, that that's a very, you know, valid question. So, it you know, it's a it's a deep mystery that anyone can go out there and see. But you know, for more than a hundred years of people knowing about it, nobody's actually solved the puzzle. Yeah, and what about these crazy, um, these stories of massive caverns underneath the? Mm. Uh, Death Valley area and the yeah. weird discoveries there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, these go back to roughly the 1920s and particularly through the 1930s when a number of, I guess, so called Indiana Jones type adventurers and explorers claimed to have discovered or stumbled upon in some cases where they literally claimed to have sort of fallen through the ground. Um, these very deep caverns deep below um, Death Valley, which rather than being, you know, just regular normal caves and caverns that we've all been into at one time or another, these were reportedly filled with what appeared to be evidence of ancient civilizations in the U.S. that, you know, came along far beyond even the Native American tribes and things like that. For example, a number of these explorers and adventurers talked about coming across what seemed to be probably the closest thing you could imagine to like a sunken ancient Roman or Egyptian city, you know, sort of ancient treasures, um, sort of pillars and, you know, sort of Greek type pillars and buildings. Some of them, of course, in like a very ruined state, but suggesting that, you know, could there have been an ancient civilization that existed in the United States, possibly even tens and tens of thousands of years ago that vanished without a trace and that there are these remaining remnants of them. Um, people talked about seeing sort of mummified figures in you know, sort of regal clothing and things like that. Um, the big problem, of course, is not that the people themselves weren't credible or weren't named. I mean, I, I actually point out in the book that all the people who made these claims did so on the record. The problem is that they were very reticent to reveal the exact locations in Death Valley where they'd stumbled upon these sort of alleged priceless underground realm, if you like. And I guess the main reason was, you know, they didn't want anybody else to sort of beat them to the to getting the secret out or plundering all the, you know, the treasures that were down there. But what was interesting is that these stories and the people themselves kind of literally vanished without a trace, which has sort of led to speculation that maybe they went back there and got lost inside, got trapped, died. Or even as some people think, you know, what if the survivors of these civilizations are still down there and don't want us to know. You know, you stumble on their ground and you don't get out again, you know, unless you're really lucky. So there's a lot of weird controversies like that concern in, you know, what might be going on, not necessarily just on Death Valley, but, but way below it as well. Yeah, that is, that to me was the craziest story. And whenever I hear these, mm-hmm. a new story about like El Dorado or something, I'm like, why aren't people yeah. searching for this stuff? And I mean, this is so close mm-hmm. to my house. It's like a trip to Vegas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, are there well, any... You might be the person who, you know, 
you might have personally <laughs> find it. <laughs> well, I mean, are there any modern expeditions that you know of? I feel like I should check this out. Well, that's the interesting thing that actually isn't. But the biggest irony of all is when press conferences were held in Los Angeles in the 30s, when the people involved were talking about this, they actually made an offer to like, the local archaeological groups and scientific communities and universities to send people along. And a lot of these scientists and archaeologists sort of very fearful of, of upsetting their own reputations were like, oh no, you know, we're not going to get involved in this and, you know, end up looking like idiots. And each and every one of them actually refused the invite to come along. So uh, they just didn't want to know. So in other words, that's been something that's typified many of these stories is that mainstream science and historians, they're far more worried about their reputations than they are stumbling upon something fantastic. And so that's why there's been a big stumbling block that nobody in a position of authority or you know, importance has actually taken the time to look for these places. So you know, maybe 70, 80 years later, now's, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Um, now let me ask you, this is kind of a uh, just a random question, but of all the mm-hmm. crazy stories you've heard, because I know you've heard a lot, uh, mm-hmm. if you could finance any expedition, just one, for a supposed treasure or mysterious finding, and you could mm-hmm. be the one who has that information, what expedition would you fund? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. That's <laughs> huge. Like I just thought of that. but money. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I actually think some of these things, like Death Valley and El Dorado and... Um, I also talk in the book about similar stories that are applied to Mount Shasta in California, where the rumors of ancient civilizations like Lemuria and Atlantis, supposedly Mm -hmm. surviving relics, living again deep in the caverns of Mount Shasta. And I think, you know, these stories about underground realms and ancient civilizations fascinate people. And I think not only would it be a fantastic discovery from a, you know, the perspective of, what you might actually find in terms of, you know, sort of uh, just ancient weaponry, clothing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) treasures, that sort of thing. But equally, the the way in which it would sort of rewrite our history books as a species and and a civilization. And I think, you know, and and also just for the fact that it would be a great adventure, you know, to, to go on one of these treks. So I think for me, something along those lines, you know, a literal... Indiana Jones trek into the mysteries of the past and, you know, sort of climbing mountains and swinging through caverns and, you know, that sort of stuff would be a a cool one to do. Of course. Uh, So I believe you actually said you've been to about 15 or so of the 25 spots in the book. Um, Which do you... yeah, I mean... Well, I was just going to ask you which one you thought was the creepiest or weirdest if somebody wanted to visit Mm. one and maybe come back with a good story. Sure. Well, I think personally, I would say, <coughs> excuse me, one which was only sort of like a six or seven hours drive from where I used to live in Britain, and that would be Loch Ness, Scotland. Now, yeah. you know, when you think of Loch Ness, everybody thinks of the Loch Ness Monster, which in itself is weird enough. But what makes Loch Ness even stranger is the fact that it's been the site of numerous sort of paranormal and supernatural activity that goes far beyond Nessie you know, which is obviously the most famous story there. Mm -hmm. But over the years, there's been just a massive amount of strangeness. For example, back at the dawning of the 20th century, sort of 100, 110 years ago, none other than the famous occultist, Alistair Crowley, actually had a house on the shores of Loch Ness called Beleskin House. And he engaged in a number of sort of ancient occult rites and rituals to try and conjure up demons from the loch. And Beleskin House was later owned by Jimmy Page, the guitarist with Led Zeppelin. And even in the 70s, um, Page said that the house had this sort of weird, ominous atmosphere to it. But the the house itself, there's also a deep underground tunnel, uh, which links to a local cemetery, which was, and this sort of tunneled out area was supposedly a safe haven for a local witch coven. Um, On top of that, there have been a number of UFO sightings over the lock, there uh, have been reports of large black panther-type cats roaming around the, the woods that sit either side of the loch. And in 1974, a well-known um, Loch Ness monster hunter named Ted Holliday, who actually came to believe that the Loch Ness monster was sort of supernatural rather than a flesh-and-blood animal, he claimed to have had a literal encounter with a man in black on the shores of the loch. 
Um, you know, so you've got all this extra weirdness going on at Loch Ness that most people know absolutely nothing about. And there's also a, a ghost story from the Second World War where a British military plane crashed in the lock and all but one of the crew managed to survive and get out. But there's reports of this one crewman where his ghost still um, haunts the waters and the beach area of the lock where the plane came down. So, you know, you've got everything. You've got the Loch Ness Monster, Alistair Crowley, occult rituals, UFOs, black cats, and a man in black. You know, all yeah. the Loch Ness. So that's, that's, that's pretty weird in itself. Of course, yeah, Pandora's box of weirdness. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, one of my favorite places that made the cut, and a very sexy mystery, the Bermuda Triangle. Obviously, a lot yeah. of sea and aircrafts have gone missing there. But I guess skeptics would just say, well, the o- ocean's fucking dangerous, man. But some vessels have yeah. had, they've had even... Uh, radio contact before disappearing right like that flight 19 yeah i mean this is the thing i mean i actually would agree with it and i do agree with the skeptics when they say if you're going to go out on the oceans whether it's in ships or aircraft if you're not sort of a skilled navigator people can become disoriented and confused you know um but if you rely on your instruments and follow your compass and everything else there really isn't a problem um, so in that sense, it's only, you know, if you're stranded out there and you've just got no uh, sort of technical, um, any te- technology to fall back on, then you can be in big trouble. But if you're sort of a skilled navigator, a pilot or a captain of a ship, you should be okay. But the problem is that many people who travel through uh, the Bermuda Triangle, whether it's in ships, boats or aircraft, and, you know, from large to small aircraft, they report things like um, massive... Um, compass malfunction where the compasses either just stop working or they just spin wildly so that people are unable to differentiate between you know are they going north east south west or or round in circles you know um, so that's a big problem and a number of people and this is where it gets very weird are reported feeling mentally disoriented as if their sort of common sense factors have gone out the window and that kind of applies to the most famous case of Flight 19, this an entire flight of Navy U.S. Navy Avenger aircraft that disappeared in the Triangle in December 1945. This was like a, as I said, a whole fleet of aircraft, and even one of the search planes that went looking for them vanished without a trace as well. Mm-hmm. But what was interesting was that these this particular um, unit of Avenger aircraft, they were based out in Florida, so they knew the area very well, um, and so they headed from from Florida out into the Atlantic, which, of course, you know, you head east um, out of the U.S. mainland. And they reported how the sky looked weird, the, the small islands that populated that particular area looked strange, which in themselves were strange words and phrases to use, and they didn't actually explain what they meant other than things didn't look like they should. But what was even stranger was that, you know, if you head away into the Atlantic and you head east... Um, into obviously into the Atlantic Ocean and you're lost. Well, all you've got to do is look at your compass and swing round and go west. Yeah. And in a short time, you'll reach land again. You know, that's everybody, you don't have to be Einstein to know that. You know, if you're going east and you don't like going that way or you know you've got to go the opposite way, just do a complete 180. They didn't even think to do that. They just literally flew around in circles and then their radio messages got weaker and weaker and vanished one by one. Now, people have said, well, maybe they ditched in the ocean. The problem is that no aircraft wreckage was ever found, no bodies were found, and there was even sort of no telltale oil slick or gasoline slick or anything like that from any of the aircraft or even the the chase plane that went after them. For all intents and purposes, they just literally all disappeared. So while I do admit that, you know, you do have to be very careful when you're in the oceans, that case, more than any other, is a real sort of standout one in terms of, you know, containing all the aspects in, of these sort of classic encounters in the Bermuda Triangle. And do you think it's like a magnetic anomaly? Or do you think it's mm. like a doorway of some kind, like an interdimensional portal or something? Yeah. Well, what? you know, I kind, of, I kind of look at it from both angles, really. I mean, there are stories where... People have talked about flying through the Bermuda Triangle and suddenly going through this very weird and eerie, weird and eerie looking green fog. And, when and that's when their equipment starts to malfunction, like compasses and um, 
other navigation equipment and then they come through it and realize well you know they've just been through the Bermuda Triangle and survived it but there are other stories where you know ships have vanished uh, almost as if they're being sucked down or something like that but one of the things that typifies many of these cases is we never find wreckage we never find bodies so that has given rise to the idea of so-called portals and window areas which I talk about a lot in the book for example things today like quantum physics are allowing for the existence of extra dimensions or multi dimensions that might coexist with ours and perhaps perhaps you know through deliberate means or possibly even natural means via science that we don't understand yet sometimes perhaps our realm of reality crosses paths with other ones and something gets sucked through and then it's not able to get back again you know, and vice versa. Maybe sometimes when we see weird creatures like Bigfoot that are here one minute and gone the next, maybe they're doing exactly the same thing. You know, perhaps they're sort of almost like dimension hopping. Yeah, it's it's kind of an anomalous place, but it does seem like one of the hotbeds for weirdness. Um, I guess another really good one is North Wales and the, the Berwyn Mountains. Mm -hmm. There's a pretty crazy UFO crash story there. I'm surprised that one's not more talked about. It should be more famous in Roswell. Well, I mean, yeah, the Berwyn Mountains is this huge, very, very ancient uh, mountain range in North Wales. And, and even today, you know, the, the area itself hasn't changed much for centuries. It kind of, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of populated by these sort of classic little British villages, you know, where... There's one pub, a graveyard, and a bunch of cottages and things like that, you know. Um, it's, it's like something straight, a lot of the villages is like something even today, straight out of the Hound of the Baskervilles or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very atmospheric area, sort of steeped in ancient mystery. And the Berwins are sort of typified, again, by not just one mystery, but several. Um, not too far from the, the foot of the mountain range is a, a lake called Lake Bala. And Lake Bala has a lake monster tradition attached to it, not unlike that of the Loch Ness monster. And the, whereas the creature of Loch Ness is known as Nessie, mm -hmm. um, Lake Ballas is called Teggy. And um, the story, or there are lots of stories as to what this creature or creatures might be. Everything from like a giant sort of mutated uh, pike, or possibly sort of 12 to 13 feet long. Other people have suggested something like a freshwater crocodile. Some people think it could be a totally unknown animal. You know, we just don't really know until or if we ever catch one of these things. But on top of that, even the name Berwyn itself um, is sort of like a derivation from two words, which essentially sort of mean kingdom of the fairies. Um, and that in itself is intriguing. Um, but the most famous mystery attached to the Berwyn Mountains occurred in January 1974, when local villagers in the area reported seeing strange lights in the sky and then feeling what sounded like the impact of something crashing onto the side of the mountain. And because of this, um, the emergency services came out, the British Army um, and the Royal Air Force sent planes to fly over the mountain and uh, Land Rovers went up there and you know uh, trucks uh, full of troops and a lot of stories about roads being cordoned off by the military preventing even the police from getting up there. And um, the official story, the, the British government and the Ministry of Defence don't actually avoid talking about um, this event in January 74, but they say that the strange lights in the sky were meteors re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and that the, the presumed impact on the mountain was a localised earthquake. But if that was the case, then it's very weird that there should have been this re-entry of meteorites right over the Berwins at the same right. time that there, was a me that there was an earthquake on the ground at the Berwins as well. You know, it almost sounds too good to be true. Mm -hmm. And since that time, a number of British military people have come forward to claim knowledge or personal involvement in the recovery of alien bodies and very, very strange wreckage from the mountainside that was whisked away to a place in the south of England called Porton Down. And Porton Down is a government establishment, a highly secret facility where the government does all its research into things like exotic viruses, chemical warfare and biological warfare and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want to autopsy an alien body where you're worried that it might contain hazardous viruses or something like that, then Porton Down would be the ideal place to do the autopsy where there'll be a great deal of 
prevention of you know contamination and leakage of virus viruses outside of you know the confines of the facility. And do you think there's an explanation for why uh, certain places or people, for that matter, are prone mm. to more paranormal experiences and sightings mm. than than other places? Well, again, I think certainly in terms of places, I do personally believe it comes down to the idea of these window areas or gateways, um, you know, to, to other realms of existence. I guess the simplest way to describe it is, you know, you, you're driving down the road in your car and you don't like the radio channel that's on, so you flip to another. You don't like that one, so you flip to another. And all these channels are going on at the same time, but you can only be tuned into one at any given moment. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how quantum physics describes sort of multi-dimensions, that they're all existing at one moment, but we can only be in one. And of course, most of us, if not all of us, don't possess the technology to jump from one to the other. But maybe beings or creatures far more advanced than, than us can do that. And perhaps that's why we see them sometimes in our realms. And maybe, um, again, quantum physics has sort of or physicists, I should say, have speculated on the idea that maybe some of these gateways occur naturally and randomly. So in other words, you could be walking you know, through an area of forest land and suddenly find yourself transported, as some people suggested, you know, to previous times or to a totally different world, and then 20 minutes later, they're suddenly back in their own world wondering what on earth happened. You know, but you made sort of like a temporary transition to somewhere else through a natural action of nature, um, you know, and then you were, you were sort of tossed back into your, your own realm again. Huh. And I guess there's also a lot of researchers that are coming to conclusions about Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster themselves, mm -hmm. the actual entities, that there might be a, just a paranormal aspect to them rather than just uh, Bigfoot being an ape creature, because it is so strange that in this... Mm -hmm densely populated world with all the technology we have we can't get a body we can't get uh really good photographs but it would kind of explain things if they were some type of energy that were just you know some kind of timeless energy that's falling through uh these gateways of some kind well yeah i mean that's that's actually what a lot of people think and you know i go down that path that um you know bigfoot is more of a paranormal thing than just a flesh and blood Hey, you know, a lot of mainstream cryptozoologists, people who look for these things, you know, disagree with me. And that's, you know, that's fair enough. And we'll never really know until or unless we get a body or not. Um, but you're right, you know, I mean, the, in the United States, there would be thousands and thousands of Bigfoot running around, reproducing, living, feeding, countless times seen running across roads and photographed and people even trying to shoot them. We should have at least one body. And the fact that Bigfoot sort of typifies this kind of here one minute and gone the next type situation, I actually do think, you know, there's something about this that goes far beyond it just being an ape that science and zoology haven't found yet. And I'm more inclined to think that we are dealing with some sort of transitory creature that, you know, does flit in and out of our reality. I would don't pretend to know what its specific realm is, but if it can do it, to order, then that would probably suggest that these creatures, they may look savage and primitive, but I would suggest they probably would have to be fairly highly evolved, you know, to be able to, to do that if, if, you know, the very fact that we're not able to do it, you know. Yeah, that would be quite the M. Night Shyamalan twist, that something that looks yeah. <laughs> exactly like what you'd consider a caveman is actually yeah. laughing at our technology and laughing at our mm -hmm. advancement. Um, yeah, I mean, it may be that their technology is highly different to ours, you know, perhaps theirs is reliant more on the power of the mind, whereas we're sort of more reliant on, reliant on the power of electricity or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, maybe it's sort of a, a, such an alternative energy or science that we don't even, you know, we don't even literally see it. You know. And you also discuss in the book, uh, I guess there's a parallel to the Bermuda Triangle with the Japanese equivalent in the Devil's Sea. What have you discovered about that? Yeah, well, the Devil's Sea um, is one of a number of places, not unlike the Bermuda Triangle, that exist around the world, where there seems to have been a you know, far greater amount of disappearances of ships, aircraft, light planes, boats, than there should be. Um, 
And for that reason, it's become known as the Devil Sea. Now, what's interesting about the Devil Sea, which is not too far from uh, off the coast of, of Tokyo, what's interesting about the Devil Sea is that whereas the stories from the Bermuda Triangle just go back, for the most part at least, you know, sort of two or three hundred years, mm -hmm. the stories from the Devil Sea actually date back more than a thousand years. Now, Japan has a long tradition in its folklore and mythology of stories of sea dragons, you know, and that's why... That's actually one of the reasons why in Japan the Godzilla movies are so popular because they sort of pay homage to sort of these early dragons that are, you know, are a staple part of Japanese folklore. Um, but even sort of 10, 11 centuries ago, um, the area was perceived by the Japanese people of that period as being very weird and ominous and that there was something going on that was making all their you know, sort of ocean-going ships and galleons of, of that era vanish. And at that time, it was all put down to sort of like giant fiery dragons living under the oceans that would pull ships and sailors down to their deaths. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, unless somebody comes across the body of a dragon, you know, I think we can sort of relegate that to, to mythology. But what we can't relegate to mythology is the idea or the fact, in my view, that the Japanese were using these stories of dragons to try and explain a very real phenomenon, namely the real disappearance of ships under unexplained circumstances. And that's an important thing to remember is that, you know, regardless of who or what was doing it, the ships were vanishing, the people were vanishing, and, and it predated the Bermuda Triangle stories by centuries, but parallels them very closely as well. Man, it does definitely seem like there's some type of strange connection have you tried to map any of these places like on to see if they're in any kind of any kind of pattern or alignment comes up well i mean some people have done that and then you know they've said well it seems to be that you know they crisscross if you were to sort of put draw like a straight line through the planet some of them crisscross and then skeptics have said well you know this is all dependent on where you kind of draw the line as to where this particular region right. ends you know so it's you're always going to have that argument. But what I can say is there are a number of places like this in the world. Um, for example, a book was written back in the 70s about how the entire Great Lakes area seemed to be almost identical in the terms of ships and aircraft and people vanishing throughout the Great Lakes region of the U.S. So, you know, it could well be that there are a number of these regions that have been sort of underappreciated because people just think, oh, well, it's pilots and ship's captains getting lost and then running low on fuel and sinking or dishing, ditching in the ocean, you know. So, But it may actually not be if we look at these stories more carefully. And one thing I liked about reading your book is you got places from all over, several that I haven't even heard of, but it does seem like there's a subtext in your book that other cultures, Eastern cultures, have more of a curiosity and a reverence for their mysteries than the western world especially in the u.s i mean would you say that's that's true they seem to be more accepting yeah i think and i think one of the reasons for that is because although the western world is technologically more advanced the more technologically advanced you become it's kind of like you not only become reliant on it but you take a step away from the more spiritual world and when i say spiritual world i don't mean literally just you know christianity or mm -hmm. or any particular religion what i mean is the idea that there are sort of other realms and alternative um mysteries and things like that out there you know we become very sort of desensitized and more black and white you know we're reliant on computers and tv and cars and you know the radios and the internet but we've kind of lost touch with the sort of magical earth energies and the, and the fact that there are profound mysteries out there and the more we forget about them and underappreciate them or totally you know a total lack of appreciation i think what happens is that we don't go looking for them we we apply less interest in them and it's almost like there's a, a karma type situation where the people who you know you start to forget about these things and the existence of these phenomena and they don't manifest for people, yet those people go looking for them and have a deep interest in them, they still experience these phenomena as if you know, the phenomena kind of gets its grips into the people who believe in them and those that don't believe in them. It's like, well, 
you know, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other, th- I had no idea that the Philippines had such a wide variety. It seems like the biggest variety of cryptids of any mm. place seems to be in Laguna. I mean, tell us about some of those yeah. more interesting cases. Yeah, but the Philippines has sort of long and rich folklore mythology, probably more than anything else of of cryptids, sort of fantastic creatures and mysterious animals that science tells us doesn't exist, or don't exist, I should say. Um, And some of them, you know, there are parallels between some of the more famous monsters of the world, like Bigfoot and the Abominable Snowman, in the sense that the Philippines, you know, they have their own sort of hairy giant creatures as well that sound suspiciously like some of the ones reported elsewhere, you know, where they're described as like a cross between a large ape and something that looks sort of eerily, primitively human as well in some respects. And um, so they have those, but there are also reports of sort of horrible mothman-type, vampire-type creatures, if you like, sort of predatory winged creatures with glowing eyes that sort of terrorize the, uh, the people of the Philippines at night. And again, you know, they're sort of typical vampiric-type animals, um, not the sort of typical cloaked, um, vampires that you would see in old Bella Lugosi films or even, you know, the watered-down rubbish like Twilight, you know. The, I mean, these are more like sort of flesh-eating or blood-drinking nightmares, you know, sort of bat-winged, glowing-eyed, gargoyle-type creatures. Um, yeah. They also have a lot of reports of goblin-type creatures. And all around the world, is, you know, you find stories of the so-called little people and um, you know, the Philippines is no exception. It has a lot of tales and traditions of sort of highly advanced uh, sort of trickster-like little people that come out at night and sort of plague and torment the locals. Well, there are some researchers who come to the conclusion that through time we're really dealing with some type of the same phenomenon that manifests Mm. itself in different ways over time, whether it be fairies or leprechauns or you know, even in more modern times, UFOs and the greys. Do you make that connection as well? Do you think these are related? Oh, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, you know, I don't... I mean, when people think of fairies, you know, the image today we have is sort of little female characters with wings on the back flitting around Christmas trees and whatever, you know. Right. That's actually a creation of only about the last 150, 200 years. Prior to that time, particularly in Britain, fairies were sort of perceived as as actually quite ominous characters that could be as friendly and playful as they could be trickster-like and and malevolent. Um, They were described more along the lines of of small, wizened, um, sort of goblin little people who would live in caves and caverns and come out at night and sort of steal milk and animals and kidnap babies and terrorize people in their bedrooms. And, And of course, this all fits in very closely with today's alien abduction stories. I mean, mm-hmm. the parallels are so close. For example, in fairy lore, you know, men would often be taken to the fairy kingdom to mate with the fairy queen and to create half-human, half-fairy offspring, which is like a classic case today with the alien greys and making hybrid children. You know, and when people were in the fairy kingdom, when they came back, they'd find two days had gone by when they thought just two hours had gone by, which is you know, today's equivalent mm-hmm. of missing time. In Real common. Yeah, and you even have a UFO angle where, you know, people today have abductions, they see UFOs. Back four or 500 years ago, people talked about going into the woods and before the fairies would turn up, they would see fairy lights. In other words, something unknown flying in the sky that was brightly lit. Mm-hmm. And they would see these fairy rings on the ground, which in retrospect sounds somewhat like crop circles. So... Yeah. You, I think one person's fairy or goblin is another person's alien. <laughs> but where I take it a bit further than some other people, I actually wonder if the phenomenon kind of camouflages itself and manifests according to the beliefs and subconscious scenarios of the people of that era. So maybe, you know, the, the phenomenon itself changes in the way it presents itself to people. I mean, literally. You know, maybe we've never seen it in its real form, but it, it, it kind of appears according to our preconceived perceptions of how these things should appear, you know. Definitely. Something I just thought about is even in 
uh, the Disney universe, Tinkerbell herself. I mean, she glows, which is kind of odd. And when you see her flying around, it looks just like the stories of the orbs that you see flying around, you know? Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, you can draw many parallels throughout history of, you know, countless cultures of of the little people where, you know, the, the... the similarity between today's abductions, you know, only an idiot would, would ignore them. But unfortunately, a lot of abduction researchers do ignore them. You know, they just don't want to, they think it's tainting their research. But if they would look into it deeply, they'd find actually would, would help, you know, in the search for answers, I think. It is a shame. I, I run into that kind of a lot on this show with uh, certain people come out of the woodwork and start telling me, oh, you know, you're having a psychic on, you believe in psychics? It's like, no, interest doesn't necessarily mean belief. Yeah. It's just, you know, we have we can look at it and at the end be like, eh, there's nothing there. But why just ignore things? Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing. I mean, people say to me, you know, well, what do you believe in this or do you believe in that? And belief is a sort of very emotive term mm-hmm. because none of us really should be believing in anything without proof. What we should be doing is investigating it and trying to the best of our ability to come to a conclusion. And even if we can't come to a conclusion, we should try and figure out, based on the evidence that we do have, what looks to be going on or what may be going on, but to recognize that a conclusion or a theory and a belief is different to hard fact. So, you know, I'm convinced there's a genuine... Bigfoot phenomenon. There's no doubt about that. But I don't believe it's a, a giant ape any more than I can say I believe fully that it's interdimensional. You know, I, I conclude because there are a number of reports of Bigfoot vanishing in a flash of light or flitting in and out of our reality, that the path for me suggests we go down that sort of portal or doorway type route. But that's very different from you know, believing that or having proof of it, you know, we need to sort of stay grounded when we're dealing with controversies like this. Agreed. And uh, you mentioned a minute ago, like these winged creatures, and there is another story, again in California, Devil's Gate Dam that crops up uh, with Marvel Whiteside, Whiteside Parsons, who followed Crowley, and it seems like wherever these occultists go, so does some kind of weird creatures. I mean, they could be, would you suggest, maybe conjuring these things? Well, I'm not sure if they're conjuring them or, you know, the, the whole thing with, um, with Crowley was that, you know, he was involved in a lot of rites and rituals to try and, I guess, invoke these entities. But the important thing is that he wasn't so much invoking them from, you know, his subconscious sort of creating something out of his mind and giving it substance in the real world. He was a believer, you know, in the existence of sort of multi, multi-layered realms, and that if you knew how to do it, you could invoke them into our reality. So I think there's a good chance that uh, you know a skilled occultist using some of these ancient teachings, which the ancient man knew a great deal more about than we do. I think have the skills to actually, into the metaphorical terms, you know, turn the key and open a door that allows something in according to these sort of rites and rituals. Mm. Now, of course, the big question is whether you actually want to allow one of these things through or you should, you know, depending on whether it's friendly or totally malevolent. And if you do allow it through, well, how do you get rid of it again if you don't like what <laughs> you see? Or can you, can you even get rid of it? You know, and, and one of the big things I point out, not so much in this book, but in other books that I've written, is that when people open these doors and let things through. You know, it's like sometimes everything just goes goes to shit in their lives. You know, it's like they're mm-hmm. being hit by this total negative atmosphere where, you know, it just runs of bad luck, um, physical health problems, mental health problems, you know, just disaster upon disaster. The refrigerator stops working, you know, the washing machine goes out. And it's all at one time as if, you know, a total air of negativity, negativity created by this being has, has descended on you for daring to sort of disturb its slumber or whatever, you know. Yeah, I I hear that all the time. But also another thing, I know you don't do a lot of work on the, you know, Illuminati or global elite, but you always hear stories mm. that they're doing, you know, satanic rituals and stuff too. And it's mm. such a weird thing because it's like they seem to be doing okay. <laughs> 
Well, again, I think, you know, it depends. I, I actually do believe there's something to the idea that what you go looking for, you know, you actually mm-hmm. get. And I think yeah. there's people, you know, people dabbling with Ouija boards, you know, if I think it's a call on a Friday night to get a bunch of beer in and, you know, let's try and contact your grandmother or whatever, <laughs> you know. But um, joking aside, that there is evidence, you know, this actually works, but sometimes you can get sort of like a, a, an entity or a, a very negative thing that sort of manifests or, you know, pretends to be something it's not. In other words, you know, it, it's not the real thing you think you're calling through. But also people like Crowley, you know, they recognize, Crowley wasn't a dabbler, you know, he was a very skilled occultist who knew the hazards of what happens if you go looking for these things. And he even, you know, was very careful as to the type of, that he went looking for and the type that he felt could benefit him because he knew there were those that, you know, were negative and would only end in disaster. And, of course, maybe that's with some of these, you know, sort of conspiratorial groups and political organizations that do this sort of thing that they actually, you know, they don't do it randomly. They focus on the ones that they think are going to give them health, wealth and power or whatever, you know, rather than... There's some supernatural powers, if you like, mm-hmm. uh, which is the sort of thing that Crowley was looking for. And he comes up, Alistair Crowley, he comes in, up in a couple of your books, and <laughs> I I feel like you could do a whole show just on him. He's so fascinating. But do you know like how he got into it? What kind of guy was he? Because he seems somewhat like kind of evil, but, I mean, he was yeah. also famous, right? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say he was evil. I think that's more the sort of simplistic image people have, you know, if you double in the True. occult, you know, people think you're slaughtering babies at midnight on Halloween <laughs> or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which, isn't the, which isn't true at all. You know, Pars, excuse me, Parsons, um, Crowley's view was that there are other realms beyond ours, you know, sort of inhabited by magical, fantastic creatures, which you can almost do like a, a deal with, um, you know, in return for offering them something or doing something for them, you know, you can be sort of honored with, as I said, wealth, power, and whatever you want. Um, now, so that was sort of very much his approach. It wasn't conjuring up demons to kill people. You know, it was opening doorways to try and do deals with these powerful entities and enrich his own life, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting, from a psychological perspective, when you ask how did he get involved, he actually grew up in a very strict, orthodox, normal, religious background, you know, where his, his father was a very domineering religious character, and he rebelled against that. So you could argue, you know, there's actually a bit of a psychological thing going on, you know, sort of the typical teenage rebellion against dad. Yeah, to an know, extreme. Most people, yeah, whereas most people, you know, you wear a, I know, a Sex Pistols t-shirt and get your nose pierced and dye your hair green. You know, amen. He, he went, yeah, amen, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, instead of doing that, he went down the other path of not just, you know, sort of dabbling with witch, witch boards, but literally immersing himself massively in sort of ancient books and poring over them for months and years at a time. And, and some of these rituals he engaged in, I mean, they were like weeks long. I mean, literally, not sort of Friday night with a few beers. You know, I mean, literally where he would go on starvation mode, living on, you know, the smallest amounts of food and, and water as possible to purify his mind and body and get himself in trance-like states caused by almost like near starvation to enter into sort of some sort of interaction with these beings. Yeah, he's such a strange guy. I mean, probably the most mm. interesting story is his, uh, I don't know if it would be channeling or his communication with the entity Lamb. Do you think there's any validity mm. to that story? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at Lamb today, retrospectively, it looks almost like the creature on the front of Whitley Strieber's communion. Yeah, you know, great. Although it's got eyeball, you know, it's got eyeballs and a pupil, but if you just painted in those eyes that are totally black, there's really no difference. You know, it's like got this large um, sort of bald head, these penetrating eyes, little thin nose and mouth, um, a huge head sitting on these tiny shoulders. It looks like one of today's greys, but this was sort of conjured up, you know, before 1920. This was like 1918, 1919. Um, and again, I, I don't think there's any doubt that that what Crowley conjured up is what today passes for the greys. And um, 
that's why I'm less inclined, well, not inclined, you know, I, I don't believe that the greys, whatever they are, are literal aliens coming in, literal nuts and bolts craft. I think they're far stranger, possibly, rather than being alien in the sense of being extraterrestrial, I think they're more likely alien in the sense of being interdimensional. Mm -hmm. And maybe they come through when they want to, but maybe, you know, if the power of the mind, we go looking for them, they know, you know, their radar kind of goes off when they know someone's looking for them and maybe they manifest, you know, like channeling. Um, a lot of people sort of look down on channeling, but I think, you know, the idea you get yourself into an altered state and you call these things forth, it's like something sparks off like a radar or a red light flashes at their mm -hmm. end, you know, in simple terms, and, and then they appear if they choose to. And I think that's what happened with Crowley. And I mean... Like the Schreiber's books, you know, a lot of people haven't read them, think it's just straightforward stories of abduction. If you read Communion, you know, that's as much about magic and rite and ritual to, you know, sort of try and get these things to appear and synchronicities mm -hmm. and all sorts of weird stuff. But I think that's why there was a lot of backlash against Schreiber because a lot of people in ufology thought they were going to get a story of um, alien abduction, you know, eggs and sperm and DNA take and all that <laughs> alien scientists but you know you really had something that was for me far better and a more open minded and deeply alternative in terms of looking for answers but you know the, uf the ufological old school they don't want to hear about it you know and that, that's what you're up against unfortunately yeah well when you think about lamb do you, like I mean because there is a you know a drawing a representation of him was this something that came from Crowley's mind, or do you think like there was a, uh, you know, like did it was it a holographic representation, or? Well, I mean, it, it's difficult to say because when people get into these altered states, you know, whether it's through just trance, repeated meditation, or whether it's you know through something like masculine or LSD, you know, the the, the big question is. Are people seeing something that manifests in our world, or are they seeing something that manifest that is real and external but manifests within the human mind? You know, that's these are the big questions, and, and I don't think even today, with all the research that's been done, we can be fully clear. You know, the idea with alien abductions—they often happen to people when they're asleep in, in bed. In other words, they occur in the dream state. Mm -hmm. Now, skeptics will say. Well, that means it was just a dream. But what if, as a lot of researchers that's now coming down to the idea, what if this other realm, this other dimension, can actually, inter and the entities from it, can interact with us in our dream state? That's to say, what if their normal state of existence is kind of like our dream state? And so they can hop from that to ours. So what appears to be a real experience or a very re vivid dream actually is something that's really being played out in our mind, but in a, in a way, in a fashion so fantastic that it's almost impossible to believe it could occur, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the dream state itself is a type of reality. The best like, way to describe it would be something like the Matrix, you know, um, a, a totally real-looking environment that, that doesn't exist, you know. Well, and also, not only dream states, but psychedelic states. I mean, myself... I've had one experience. I talk about it every so often on the show, but it is just one of those things I understand it's like hard to explain if you if, if you had to be there kind of story. But I mean, on uh, on Salvia, I experienced uh, a male and female entity. It was all nothing I could visualize, but just like a, a sensed presence. And uh, yeah. long story short, the dialogue was essentially this male presence was like, yeah, man, I'm glad you're here. Like, it's super cool that, mm -hmm. you know, we're able to communicate with you. And then there was like a female presence that was a little more cynical that was like, he's not going to stay here. Stop. He's not going to get here. Mm. Leave him alone. And then mm. it was over. And that's happened a couple of times and it's reported all the time. I mean, these. I think mm. there's something about the psychedelic state and the dream state and, you know, any altered state, there seems to be a connection between all of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing with psychedelics is that, you know, people say, well, it's just an experience where the mind hallucinates. But I'm not, I actually don't think that is the case. I mean, when you talk about having like a positive and a negative in your experience, I mean, the whole thing with psychedelics is that the 
you know the the setting and uh, is as important as the mood mm-hmm. you know the mind frame it seems important it's like if you having a first time trip on LSD and you're scared stiff that it's all going to go wrong or your heart's going to beat wildly and you know for the <laughs> stroke then you can all but guarantee that what you experience in that state is probably going to be pretty negative if you go in open minded and thinking this is going to transform me and elevate me that's usually what happens it's a positive experience so again i think this has, this demonstrates this whole issue of the phenomena reacting to it according to the mindset of the person you know kind of like that karma thing that you get what you ask for in life you know if you're the sort of person who sees the glass the glass is always half empty it's going to stay half empty mm-hmm. you see it is half full it magically fills its way up you know and i think that's and i do think psychedelics do open portals you know to other realms and i, I actually do think some of these realms are maybe all of them you know are like a, a matrix style dream world that we can insert ourselves in you know it's kind of like we're an addition to the program and we can be loaded you know onto the mainframe or whatever and then you know downloaded onto the hard drive mm-hmm. briefly and then we're sucked back into our body afterwards and psychedelics i think are the, are the equivalent of sticking a thumb drive into the side of your laptop your laptop and you know downloading it i think <laughs> the the change in, my, in mind is the same as you know putting a new JPEG onto your computer or whatever. It's adding something to, you know, the memory or whatever. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Have you yeah. yourself ever had any uh, paranormal sl- psychedelic experiences? Um, well, the closest I can think of in terms of what I've just been speaking about is where I had a very sort of weird sleep paralysis type experience about 10 years ago. And this is actually when I was doing, like, trans meditation stuff. Hmm. And... I was at sleep one night, this was like 2002 or 2003, something like that, so nine or ten years ago. And you know, sleep paralysis, this situation where people, you know, kind of semi-awake in the middle of the night, can't move, and they feel there's this hostile, often hostile presence coming towards them. Um, or often, you know, it sort of straddles them in the bed. It's kind of like the incubus succubus situation or in mm-hmm. Canada they have a, a very prevalent legend of the old hag sort of this hideous old woman that sort of you know sort of comes in your bedroom and straddles you in the middle of the night which probably would be, <laughs> would be pretty frightening yeah. but the one I had it was with like a like a like a bipedal figure like a man-like figure in a cloak and a cowl but with a, a wolf's like face so you know almost like a definitive werewolf but it was yeah. making this growling noise but it didn't sound like a random growl although i couldn't obviously understand what it was for some reason i knew it was like a like an animalistic language is the best way i can describe it rather than just random growling like Man. your dog might do you know and i could sense it sort of coming down the corridor towards the bedroom i was living in like a duplex at the time so all the rooms were on one side of the corridor you know they all ran down the length of the corridor um and i had sort of this graphic image of this thing coming towards the room and making this rapid growling noise and I had to make sort of a supreme effort to to wake up. And as I did, you know, I had that sort of vague imagery of it sort of retreating and, and charging out the room and, and just sort of dissipated, if you like. So uh, that was a pretty pretty weird and traumatic experience. So I, and then afterwards, I did sort of a lot of cleansing stuff in the house with things like sage <laughs> and something. And it happened once after. Yeah. I saw like a shadowy thing looming over me in bed again and i did this cleansing stuff again and eventually you know it was like the the darkness was lifted so to speak you know like the sun coming up kind of thing. it's kind of like you met a modern anubis or something that's that is wild yeah that's actually a good way to describe it actually you know, kind of like, now what i didn't see though was sort of you know the anubis got these huge ears it would be the cowl the hood looked like you would see on a normal person you mm-hmm. know no, no point sticking through so that's actually a good point but I never gave that a thought before that there wasn't sort of a huge ears. It was just like the long snout and the and the growling that sort of created that sort of werewolf type imagery, if you like. Man, that is, that is a wild one. But is there anyone like I love the stories of Crowley? But is there anyone in more modern times that you would consider um, kind of the head of this field, a modern day Crowley? 
Well, um, <laughs> not so much in terms of what he did, but in terms of realising that altered states can invoke um, interaction with other entities. I mean, Dr. Rich Strassman's book, The Spirit Molecule, which talks mm-hmm. about how DMT um, can you know, open doors to what don't just seem like hallucinations, but sound very much like advanced entities from somewhere else that, again, you know, we can altered states of mind allow us access to their realms. The DMT study that, that Strassman did and wrote up in his book, The Spirit Molecule, that's a very good study of how, you know, rituals and altered states can alter people's minds. Also, um, I mean, there's a number of other people who's, whose work, you know, um, Adam Go Rightly, he's written a number of books that yeah. delve into this as well. He was my um, guest uh, three days ago. Funny. Oh, cool. Oh, well, Adam's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine. And, you know, he's written about, um, you know, things like how altered states and doorways being opened by people like Parsons and Crowley, you know, and letting these things flow into our realm. So, you know, I think I think people like that and who recognize that, that there's more to this world than we see and that sometimes, in simple terms, getting out of it, you know, actually allows you into it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, uh, getting back to the world's weirdest places, what is your favorite story from the book that we might not have touched on? Um, let me see. <laughs> it is jam-packed um, full of stories. Like, that's what I love about well, yeah, really all your books is you just keep going. Well, actually, I think probably the, the stories from Halifax, Nova Scotia, which are so varied. I mean, this little town in, in um, Nova Scotia, where there have been um, sightings of sea serpents off the coast, uh, massive amounts of ghostly activity through to this very day, particularly in a, a local restaurant in town called the Five Fishermen, which used to be a morgue, a mortuary, and where a lot of the bodies from the Titanic were taken after that sunk in 1912, and even a massive amount of UFO activity over the town. So I think for me, Halifax is probably the favorite because the mysteries are so drastically different between each other you mm-hmm. know you've got the titanic's ghosts and then you've got these monstrous sea serpents surfacing from the waves and then reported alien activity right over the town itself as well. yeah varieties of spice of life is what they say you know <laughs> exactly yeah. um and- <laughs> Are there any places you looked into that didn't make the cut? Like, what would be your 26th location? <laughs> um, well, there were some that, you know, I could have included, but the reason I didn't, and which are well known, the reason I didn't is because I couldn't add anything new. And, for example, mm-hmm. the most famous one would have been Point Pleasant, where the Mothman appeared in the mm-hmm. 60s. And, you know, John Keel wrote all about this in Mothman Prophecies. And he chronicled you know, the Mothman reports, UFO activity, poltergeist, contact cases, men in black reports, and of course the collapse of the Silver Bridge in town, which spanned the Ohio River and killed all these people and they drowned, you know, the cars mm-hmm. just fell into the river. Um, beyond, I mean, that's a typical and a perfect example, but I didn't include it because I literally could not add anything new to the story. Right. And so, like with the Bermuda Triangle um, and Loch Ness, you know, I included those they're very well known, but most people didn't know about the Crowley angle or the big black cat or the men in black angle to Loch Ness. No. And I included a lot of new cases with the Bermuda Triangle. So in other words, if I could add something new, I would include it. But there were a lot of cases that I could have used, as I said, like Point Pleasant, um, like the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, this famous ranch that um, was kind of not unlike Point Pleasant. But again, it's like you've got nothing new to say and you know, if you're expecting people to buy your books, you've got to get yeah. something new. It's no good just going over old grounds. So. Yeah, I'm so glad you did that because it does make the book a much more fascinating read than just flipping the page and be like, oh, Egypt. Okay, let's read the bullet points yeah. we've done yeah. before. You know, yeah. so that's, it is an awesome book. Definitely belongs on anybody's no, coffee table. Um, well, I uh, appreciate that, Greg. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. But, uh, that pretty much does it. You know, that brings us to the top of the hour. Nick, you're a real yeah. savage, probably one of the hardest working journalists in the paranormal realm. Um, well, this... I guess it's one of these things where, luckily, you know, there's plenty to research and write about. You know, we never, we never stuck for things. True. And, I mean, I know this book just dropped like two months ago, but are you taking a break? Or are you working on anything else? No. What's next? 
<laughs> I've actually uh, no breaks. got one out shortly. It's called Monster Diary, and um, it's basically most of my sort of cryptozoology studies. Um, you know, I wrote them up sort of road trip style. You know, uh, hitting the road and going out looking for these things. And I sort of chronicle it as, as I did it. And um, Anomalous Books are putting out a book from me before the end of the year um, called Monster Diary. And it's basically like a road trip of the last three years of investigations I've done looking for werewolves, Bigfoot, lake monsters, big cats, and you know just about anything and everything monstrous. I don't actually have the, the literal exact uh, release date yet, but it probably will be in the next couple of weeks, I think, something like that. Nice. Very cool. Uh, was there anything else you'd like to leave the people with? I mean, I know your website, actually, mm-hmm. nickredfern.com, that is a website, but it doesn't seem to get updated all that much. Is there somewhere... No, that... Yeah, actually, people, a lot of people don't realize that's, although it's in my name, it's not my site. It was put together years ago by a fan. Oh, okay. They, they Makes even, sense. Yeah, they did it, and then they vanished. So, huh. unfortunately, I have no way to get into that site. Oh, they didn't even have the common courtesy to drop you the domain no, name? No, I don't, know the, I don't know the password or anything, and because I don't own oh, it, man. you know, I have no legal way to get into it. So, But I actually... But people think that is mine. They're always like, why don't you update your, your website? So, well, it's not my website. But um, I, you know, I'm glad somebody did it, but it's just a shame you know, it didn't go any further. Yeah. But I have a blog which I update uh, pretty much daily, which is uh, Nick Redfern 40 and F-O-R-T-E-A-N, dot blogspot.com. As I said, I update that pretty much daily with everything from UFOs, Bigfoot, conspiracies, what shows I'm doing, you know, TV stuff or whatever. Uh, people will also get me on Facebook and, and Twitter as well. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Nick, for coming back. Great talk. Uh-